Welcome to our weekly Bible study program. We did not have a Bible study last Tuesday because we were traveling to Houston, Texas for a great meeting that we had last week. The Lord met with us in the body of Christ in a great way. The Houston Assembly, the humble Texas Assembly, hosted a wonderful meeting. But we're back tonight with an opportunity to look into the Word of God and see if we can understand better what the Lord has said to us through his word. We always start with a brief prayer, asking the Lord to touch our minds, to illuminate our understanding, to help me. I want to understand this word right and to present it truthfully and correctly as the Lord would have it presented, and that he would touch the minds of everyone who's watching this to receive the good word of God, uh, to give us all direction and protection as we face the future, uh, a glorious future, but a very dangerous one for children of God as this world gets more and more sinful, and yet it draws us ever closer to that great day when our Lord returns. So would you join me in a brief prayer here? Our dear Heavenly Father, we come boldly before the throne of grace with a right of access that was purchased for us by the blood of Jesus. Uh, he took our sins for us, and he transferred unto us his righteousness, and because of that we can appear righteous without condemnation as we come before you and ask you for help in these troublesome times. We understand from the scriptures that in the last days perilous times shall come. Lord, we pray that we can be spared some of those terrible perils that mark our time. We ask you to guide us. We ask you to direct us. We ask for your heavenly protection. But Lord, we know we need the grace and the mercy of our Lord. The scripture says that we come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and then find grace to help in time of need. And Lord, I pray that you would provide that mercy and then that grace as we move on to the future that you have determined for the body of Christ. Help us tonight as we look into your word. May we receive good things out of this treasure house that you've given us called the Bible. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, as always, I've had some questions pre-submitted, which I will begin to address tonight. But if you have a question burning on your heart that you would like us to try to answer this very evening, then you can submit that as a comment to this Facebook page, and we will monitor those. And, and if there's a question, Julia will pass it on to me. Otherwise, feel free to submit those questions afterwards as comments or as a message to the inbox on our church Facebook page here. But I will first get into these questions that have already been given to us. And the first question says, is the 144,000 just 144,000 people, or is this tribes of 144,000? Now I'm presuming that this question is about the 144,000 that are found in Revelation 14. We believe these to be the members of the Bride of Christ. And that verse says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, is that 144,000 persons? Is it 144,000 assemblies in the body of Christ? Or is it 144,000 something else? Now, I'm not sure I can give you the definitive answer, but I can tell you how I teach it in our assembly. I have always taught that this is a literal number of overcomers, um, people who have qualified to be members of the Bride of Jesus Christ. I think it's 144,000 persons, but let me add this caveat. Uh, the caveat is that the Bible doesn't usually include women, children, or even the elderly in its numerical accounts. For example, when Jesus fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, there were far more than 5,000 people there who were fed. Matthew 14, 21 says, And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Uh, there would have been a, at least as many women and children as there were men there, uh, probably a crowd of 10, 15,000 people. But the biblical numera, numering, numbering was 5,000. And then when you numbered Israel, 
in the beginning of the book of Numbers in the first chapter, there's a little over 603,000 people that are included in the 12 tribes of Israel. They fled Egypt's bondage, but when they counted, they only counted men over the age of 20 who were able to go to war. Let me read Numbers 1, verses 2 and 3. It says, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel and their families by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles, from twenty years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shalt number them by their armies. Well, there were over 600,000 men that were included, but there had to have been roughly another 600,000 women, perhaps two million children, maybe 100,000 elderly men who were too old to go to war, maybe 90,000 men who were disabled in some way or had physical challenges, who lived alongside the 603,550 Israelites who were able to go to war. It's just that the biblical census only counts men of an age to be soldiers. That's the pattern throughout the Bible. So when Revelation 14.1 says there are 144,000 in the bride of Christ, that may just be men of the ages who could go to war. The actual number may well be higher. The number may include men uh, in the 20 to 50 year range in that 144,000. But I'm sure many overcomers were women Others were men too old to be counted as soldiers. Some may be too young. We believe Stephen, the first martyr, was younger than age 20. But I don't think this is 144,000 tribes or 144,000 assemblies. I think the Bible would have told us or given us a clue about that. But it says they have the Father's name written in their forehead, and assemblies don't have foreheads. Uh, verse 3 says that, that uh, they sung a new song. And verse 4 says, not defiled with women, uh, they were redeemed from among men. So again, I think this is a reference to the number of men that were in the bride of Christ in that 144,000. At least that's my understanding at this time, and that's the way I teach this. So next question then says, the phrase 40 days and 40 nights appear a number of times in the Bible. For example, in Genesis 7, 4, and 12, that's references to the 40 days of rain uh, that caused Noah's flood. Then the questioner mentions Exodus 24, 18, and, and 34, 28. This is the two times that Moses went up on Mount Sinai to hear from God. He was there 40 days each time. Then there's 1 Kings 19, 8, when Elijah was fleeing from Jezebel, and, and he ate some food and was able to be sustained for 40 days and nights on the food that he had. And finally, Matthew 4 and verse 2, talking about Jesus fasting in the wilderness for 40 days and nights. I'm sure there's others, but these are the ones the questioner listed. And then the question is, what spiritual connotations and similarities do they carry in those parts of the scriptures where they appear? Well, numbers often do have spiritual connotations in the Bible. And Bible numerology is a topic that's well worth studying. But I can't really take the time here to cover that entire broad subject. I will just say that the number 40 sometimes represents an era or a time or of, of a dispensation. Like King Saul reigned for 40 years. King David reigned for 40 years. King Solomon reigned for 40 years. The 40 days and nights of rain in Noah's time ended an age and allowed a new age to begin. The antediluvian world was ending and a very changed and very different world appeared after the flood. Forty also symbolizes a period of testing or trial or probation, like Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. And during Moses' life, he lived 40 years in the wilderness uh, after his 40 years in Egypt. And then God led his people out of slavery and that took another 40 years. Uh, Moses was also on Mount Sinai, like we said, 40 days and nights on two separate occasions, receiving God's law. He also spent, sent spies for 40 days to investigate the land that God had promised to the Israelites as an inheritance. Uh, 
And those were 40 days of testing for Israel. When Moses was on the mount, it was a trial or a test for the Israelites, and they failed the test. They made a golden calf instead of waiting for Moses' return. The 40 days that the spies were in the land, they brought back a good uh, report at first, but then they said the cities were walled and there's giants there and we're not able to take the land. And the children of Israel were discouraged. They failed that test during that 40-day time. Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness was a trial, a temptation for him, culminating in the devil offering him uh, three different times when Jesus had to resist, saying, uh, it is written. Uh, the prophet Jonah powerfully warned Nineveh for 40 days that they had to repent or destruction would come because of their sins. The prophet Ezekiel laid on his right side for 40 days to symbolize Judah's sins. Again, these are probably completeness. Uh, you know, I already said Elijah went 40 days without food or water at Mount Horeb. Uh, that was a time of testing. And Elijah began to feel like he was the only one still serving the Lord. And he wondered if the Lord was still with him. But that's when he heard the still, small voice of the Lord. Um, the 40 days Jesus fasted in the wilderness were before the beginning of a new era, the beginning of his three and a half year ministry. Jesus also appeared to his disciples for 40 days after his resurrection from the dead. That marked the end of another age and the beginning of a new era, the Christian era. The number 40 can represent a generation. Um, God swore that the children of Israel, because of their sins, uh, could not enter into the promised land even after they'd left uh, Egypt. You read about that in Deuteronomy 1. They were punished by wandering in the wilderness for 40 years until a new generation was allowed to possess the promised land. And Jesus, after his crucifixion, prophesied the total destruction of Jerusalem. And 40 years after that crucifixion in A.D. 70, the Roman Empire destroyed the city and burned its beloved temple. So the symbolism in the number 40 is that it represents a complete era or the completion of an era, and or a time of testing. I hope that answers the question that you had. The next question asks about the baptism of fire. It says the baptism of fire when being taught is often broken down into essentially two parts. The first part is dying to the flesh, and the second part is the persecution of your life for the cause of Christ. And that is, and that this type of persecution can only be achieved in a restored church when your life is in danger for Christ and you have to prove yourself. Now for those that will not physically make it to this first half of the last Gentile hour, how can they complete their fire baptism because their life won't be in danger? What is your understanding? And I genuinely appreciate you taking time to shed light on this. Thank you. Well, I am sure that persecution and martyrdom is coming. And if it's needed for the baptism of fire, then I guess it will be supplied. But I don't teach that the baptism of fire requires persecution unto death. I don't believe that the baptism of fire requires martyrdom. Any fire that consumes the fleshly nature, and burns out that na nature and saints of God, can be a baptism of fire. John the Baptist said in Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And with fire. It indicates two different baptisms. Now fire uh, burns up the wood, hay, and stubble in our lives. But it also purifies gold. It gets rid of the impurities in silver. Um, and so I think we all are going to have fiery trials that are needed to turn us into gold and silver and precious stones and burn up that wood and hay and stubble in our lives. The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some thing, strange thing happened to you. 
Now, I'm not sure that Peter was necessarily talking here about martyrdom because in verse 14, he's referring to the reproach for the name of Christ. Uh, he thought that being reproached was a fiery trial. And in verse 16, Peter said, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. Again, that suffering is not martyrdom because you can't be ashamed or glorify God if you're dead. Uh, but there's things you go through that are shameful at times and uh, things that you go through that honor God but are very fiery for you. He also said in 1 Peter 1 and verse 7 that the trial of your faith being more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So he's referring to the trial of your faith, though it's tried by fire. And that comes in many ways. Persecution is certainly one of them. But your faith can be tried by sickness, your broken health. Your faith can be tried by the financial difficulties you may have to go through, or family troubles, or even problems in your local church. Are you going to let those shake your faith? Are you going to let those destroy your faith? Or is that going to purify your faith and make it stronger and more pure? Will you retain your faith as you go through fiery trials? See, every disciple of Jesus is called upon to mortify the deeds of the body, to take up their own cross, and to crucify the flesh. And I believe it's your own personal baptism of fire to crucify and kill your fleshly nature. You may not have to have your body killed for that happen, to happen, but you must put to death that sinful fallen nature that you have. Paul wrote to the Colossians in Colossians 3 and verse 5. He said, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And he goes through several sins, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, idolatry. But mortify is the term that's used there in the King James Version. To mortify means to put to death. But it isn't easy to put to death the desires of your flesh. It takes a hot fire at times to burn that out of you. Then when Jesus was speaking in Mark the 8th chapter, Mark 8 and verse 34, it reads, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever shall come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, and follow me. Everyone knew what he was talking about in that age. The cross that you take up is not just some burden that you bear, a heavy load. The cross is an instrument of death. Every condemned prisoner had to take up the cross beam and carry it to the place of their crucifixion. But the cross killed everyone that was forced to bear that cross. And Jesus was saying, you've got to kill something on the inside. You've got to crucify the flesh. In fact, that's what Paul said in Galatians 5 and verse 24. He said, they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Whatever process you have to go through to crucify the flesh, whatever embarrassment, whatever loss, whatever sadness, it's all designed to crucify the old nature, to put to death the sinful, fallen nature that you have. And as you crucify that flesh, as you mortify the deeds of the body, as you take up your cross to your crucifixion, that's a baptism of fire, as I understand it. It's part of the sanctification, purification process that you go through after you've received justification in God's Holy Spirit, but there's a walk that you walk afterwards, and sometimes that's a difficult walk. Sometimes it burns like fire, but it's designed not to destroy you, but to purify you. The Lord is making gold for his kingdom. Sister Julia, we have a question. 
Did God create other sets of humans during creation apart from Adam and Eve? Did God create other humans and creation apart from Adam and Eve? That's the question that people ask when they are considering that maybe there is some validity to evolution, that maybe there were other people on the earth and maybe these bones and, and fossils that we find truly are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years old. And, and finally God picked out a man uh, named Adam or made a man like Adam who was like a human but wasn't the, one of the other humans and, and that there was a cycle of sin and death uh, or maybe not sin, but death, uh, for millions of years that animals lived and died and humans lived and died. And, and he just promised Adam that you don't have to be like that. You don't have to die. I reject that belief because I believe what Paul said about Adam, that he was the first man. He said in Corinthians, and I can turn to the scripture if I need to, but I don't have chapter and verse right on top of my head here, but but the first man, Adam, uh, was made a, 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 a first man, Adam. Then there's a second man, Jesus, but the first man, Adam, in 1 Corinthians, um, <clears throat> tells us that, that he was the first man. Um, and then... Death came by sin, and Adam and Eve were the first sinners. If there was a cycle of life and death before Adam and Eve, then the curse isn't because of sin. God pronounced a curse because of Adam and Eve's sin. He pronounced the curse on creation, on Adam and on Eve. You read about it in the third chapter of Genesis. Um, I don't see how there could be animals dying, other humans living and dying in a world that wasn't cursed. When God finished the sixth day of creation in Genesis 2, it says it was good and very good. Animals dying and, and uh, lions eating gazelles and, and dinosaurs eating other animals and people getting old and dying. To me, that's not good and very good. I don't think that, that there were any humans before Adam. Adam was the first man. And by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, the Bible says. Uh, death entered because of sin, and it was Adam's sin and Eve's sin that brought death upon the human race. Therefore, there could not have been other humans living around for, for hundreds and of thousands or even millions of years, Cro-Magnon man and Neanderthals and and uh, you know whatever else you want to say, I think there are other explanations for the fossil record. I think there's uh, there's very clear scriptural evidence that Adam was the first man, and that because of his sin, the curse was pronounced, and the curse includes death. And I don't believe there was any death in an uncursed world. Others may disagree, but this is my understanding of God's holy word. All right, then, next question comes from a couple of scriptures. It says in Daniel 9 and verse 3, that I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And then in Jonah 3 and verse 6, for word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now, the question is, ashes, as stated in these scriptures, are those ashes like we know today? And indeed, yes, they were. Uh, ashes left over from a fire. You burn wood, and, and all that's left is ash. And this was the custom in biblical times, that when someone wanted to express mourning, or great sorrow. They would literally put ashes on their forehead or on the top of their head, and they would wear sackcloth. That way everyone would know that they were experiencing great grief or sorrow or remorse or maybe repentance. See, sackcloth was a, a, a very coarse 
itchy, scratchy material usually made of black goat's hair. It was very uncomfortable to wear. And the person wearing it wanted you to know that they're as uncomfortable on the outside as they were on the inside. Um, and the ashes, they, they were sig signifying desolation and ruin. Um, these were an outward sign of mourning, of repentance, or that they were trying to abase themselves. The culture of biblical society was supposed to be a supportive community so that if someone was in trouble or in sadness or needing to repent, everyone else was supposed to know it, not to look down on them, but so they could offer their support, so they could offer words of comfort or other help. They wanted this person who was suffering, this person who was wearing sackcloth with ashes on their head, to know that I stand with you. I'm praying for you. Uh, we're still to lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen feeble knees. Um, our brothers and sisters need us as part of this community of believers. The Bible tells us to bear one another's burdens. Now, we may not put on sackcloth today or, or take ashes out of the fireplace and sprinkle them on our heads. But when we know of a brother or a sister that's having a hard time, we really need to be there for them. We need to be encouraging them and helping them as much as we can. That's our Christian duty, to love one another, to care for one another, to support one another, because everyone's going to go through some times of mourning, of separation, of sadness, of reversal, of heartache, of true repentance. And sometimes... Uh, like the king of Nineveh, he wanted God in heaven to know that his repentance was sincere and painful. And that's why he put off his kingly garments and his crown. Instead of a golden crown, he had ashes on his head. Instead of kingly garments, he put on that itchy, scratchy cloth to afflict his soul, afflict his body, and show true repentance. So yes, all of that was literal in Bible times. May not be literal today, but we're still to be helpers one of another in every aspect of the work of the Lord. Another question come in, Julia. Are there two groups of 144,000 in Revelation? Are there two groups of 144,000 in Revelation? Yes, I actually believe there are. In Revelation 7, you see a group of 144,000 redeemed Israelites. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it goes through in chapter 7 and enumerates 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from that tribe. And 12,000 times 12 tribes is 144,000. I believe that's part of the restoration of Israel, that all Israel shall be saved, as Paul said in the 14th chapter of the book of Romans. Uh, that the natural olive branches that were broken off are going to be grafted back into the tame olive tree. And uh, that Israel that was broken off 2,000 years ago at the end of the Old Testament is going to be grafted back in uh, to the true vine. And so there is 144,000 Hebrews that I believe are going to be sealed with the spirit of promise, sealed with the Holy Ghost uh, in Revelation 7. And then after them, there's a number that no one can number from every nation and kindred and tongue. But that's one group of 144,000. And then there's a different group in Revelation 14, 1, 2, 3, and 4. These are 144,000 who stand on the Mount Zion. And they have the Father's name written in their forehead. They overcome sin in their mouth. There's found no guile. They sang, as it were, a new song before the Lord and before the throne, the song of Moses and the Lamb. That is, they understand both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Not just the Jewish people with an Old Covenant, but, but Christians and people of the work of God through the ages who overcame and qualified. This is one of the revelations that Brother William Souders, who was a founder of this body of churches, he got this as a revelation from the Lord that, that the 144,000 in Revelation 14 is the bride of Christ. And later in the book of Revelation, in chapter 19, and so it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb, because the bride has made herself ready. The bride of Christ is like that new Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven. 
And who is in that bride? That's the 144,000 from chapter 14. And as I said earlier in this broadcast, uh, maybe that's just uh, an accounting of the number of men of military age that are included in that number. The actual number could be quite a bit higher. Uh, that's my uh, concern or speculation, but I think the actual number could be quite a bit higher, uh, just the way the Bible always enumerates. It enumerates those who are of military conscription age. But yes, I believe there are two very different groups of 144,000 in each group um, that are seen in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Good question, though. Um, next says, I don't know if this should be a question to discuss or not, but the scripture in Psalms says to play skillfully with a loud noise, and that seems strange to me. If you're playing skillfully, there shouldn't be just noise. Okay, well, Psalm 33 and verse 3 does say, Sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud noise. But that phrase, with a loud noise, is translated from just one Hebrew word, teruah. Teruah means an acclamation of joy. Or sometimes it means a battle cry. So the skillful playing of a musical instrument should be something that's joyful, or maybe something that stirs the hearts of God's people for spiritual battle. Now, the King James translators chose to use the word noise, N-O-I-S-E, but it really means sound, and music is sound. It's sound waves that strike our eardrums, so that noise here in Psalm 33.3 doesn't mean just loud banging or chaotic or confused, harsh sounds. Rather, it means the melodious sounds of music as worship. We're encouraged to skillfully play sounds that harmonize together, not just a cacophony of discord and indistinct sounds. In fact, 1 Corinthians 14.8 says, For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? We don't have just uncertain sounds, but there is a joyful sound, there is a beautiful sound, or there is the sound that calls us to be soldiers of the Lord. Uh, in fact, that word noise appears again in the King James Version in the 98th Psalm, where it says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. So noise can be used for rejoicing, for singing praises unto the Lord. It's, it's a joyful sound. Um, so when it says play skillfully with a loud noise, it's not just saying make a loud blat, a loud indistinct sound, but it's to make music something that sounds pleasant and encouraging and uplifting and something that may even stimulate us to prepare to do the things that the Lord would have us to do. Coming right along here, next question says, I have a question for Bible study. What must happen before Jesus returns? Well, the answer is a lot of things. There's a lot of prophecies that have to be fulfilled before Jesus returns. Sometimes out in churchianity, they'll say Jesus could come tonight. Well, no, he can't. He's told us too many things that have to happen before he returns. Uh, there are prophecies, like I say, that have to be fulfilled. And I wish I could take the time to go through all the things that, that the Bible tells us have to happen before Jesus comes to establish his millennial kingdom. And maybe some Sunday, the Lord willing, I'll preach a whole sermon on this. But really the subject is too broad to cover uh, in a short answer here. I'll just do a little bit. I'll list a few of the major events of Bible prophecy that we're looking for before the return of the Lord and the establishment of his 1,000-year kingdom. And I'll just mention these briefly. They're not in chronological order, but the Word of God tells us they will happen. And one of those is that there's going to be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or blemish at the end of this age, a church that's restored the message and order of the New Testament. I see it as the two witnesses in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation these two witnesses that have the two olive trees and oil from 
from law and grace, from Moses and Christ, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and that they're going to have a tremendous testimony. And there's scriptures that talk about uh, seek the Lord in the time, of, or pray for rain in the time of the latter rain, uh, that there is going to be a, a glory in a latter house that will be greater than the former. I also believe this gospel of the kingdom, not just the message of Babylon, but the gospel of the kingdom. What the Lord said to Brother William Souders, he said, my gospel. And that gospel has to be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. That's Jesus' words in Matthew 24, 14. He said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all the nations, and then shall the end come. Personally, as I've answered several times in these Bible study programs, I believe that the prophet Elijah or a prophet operating in the spirit of Elijah like John the Baptist did will have to come uh, before the Lord comes back, that there will be another forerunner. I base that on the fourth chapter of the book of Malachi. The last couple of verses in the Old Testament says that he'll send the prophet Elijah before the coming of that great day of the Lord. Another prophecy tells us that there's going to be a, an eighth head of the beast. There's a beast in Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. It had seven heads and ten horns. Those seven heads were great Gentile powers that, that dominated the Middle East and held the fate of the Hebrew people in their hands, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and papal Rome. But Revelation 17, 11 says there's going to be an eighth head. And that's got to rise up another civil government that dominates the Middle East and holds the fate of God's people in its hands with the potential power to destroy them. Just like the Medes and Persians, the Persian Empire in the time of Esther almost destroyed the Jew Jewish people. They didn't because they're God's people, but they almost did. The Romans almost did. Hitler wanted to. Uh, the Egyptians tried hard, the Assyrians tried their best, and there's going to be an eighth head. And that beast is going to speak. Revelation 13 and 15 says the beast will speak. That means it's going to operate. It's going to have dominion and power. I can't go into all that right now. Before the Lord turn, comes back, there has to be one last prophetic hour. However long that is, some say it's 15 years, I believe it's seven years. But Revelation 17, 12 says that the ten horns are nations or powers that have received no kingdom as yet, but they'll receive power one hour with the beast. And there's other times in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, it talks about one hour or half an hour. And that's a prophetic hour that we haven't started yet, but that hour has to start and end as the Lord returns to establish his kingdom. Again, I believe that there has to be further restoration of Israel, not just the Jews in their homeland, but as Paul said in Romans 11:26, and so Israel shall be saved. And I mentioned earlier Revelation 7, the sealing of 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. There has to be the seals and the trumpets. Some believe as they read the book of Revelation that those happened in the past. I think the book of Revelation is an apocalyptic book about the end time, the things that will happen in the last prophetic hour. And I think those seals, a book with seven seals in Revelation 5 that gets opened in Revelation 6 and 7. And then uh, there's seven angels with seven trumpets uh, in Revelation 8, 6, uh, where it mentions them and starts into the sounding of these trumpets. I think those happen in the first half of the last prophetic hour. Uh, the rapture of the bride has to occur before the Lord comes back with his bride. He's going to come for his saints, and later he will come with his saints. But 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, Behold, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the clouds and the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That rapture, halfway through the last prophetic hour, has to occur before he comes back. Uh, and then Jude says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, uh, quoting from uh, Enoch. And Revelation 19 talks about him coming with 
the armies of heaven. The seven last plagues have to occur before the Lord returns. Uh, Revelation chapter 16 shows these great vials, great bowls of judgment that God's going to pour out on the earth. Those haven't happened yet, but they happen before the Lord comes. And the seventh and last of those vials is the battle of Armageddon. And uh, that battle, which is a terrible worldwide holocaust of a scale unseen before. We've seen massive war. We've seen massive uh, destruction. But we've not seen a nuclear exchange uh, like the Battle of Armageddon is going to be. But it's at that battle that the Lord does come back. Uh, when the nations have gathered, when the epicenter of that worldwide conflict is the Valley of Megiddo, that's when the Lord will come back and force the nations to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So these are just some of the things that have to happen before the Lord comes back. Uh, I know a lot of these can transpire fairly quickly. Uh, you know, we can't just say, oh, this is way off in the future. It won't happen in my lifetime. I tell you, I'm old enough to have seen the fall of the Iron Curtain, and I was amazed at how quickly the landscape of Europe changed. I was amazed at how quickly God can act when he sets up his chessboard, and I believe he is going to set that up for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have one more question, um, and I think I have time to answer it. It just asked me to explain 1 Samuel 2, 13 through 15. That's talking about the sons of Eli who were very wicked priests. And it says that when someone offered a sacrifice, the priest would send a servant, and they would grab the with a flesh hook some of the offering that was being offered to the Lord, and they would stick it into the cauldron and bring up whatever they could with a three-pronged fork for the priest for himself. And uh, before they burnt the fat, verse 15 says, the priest servant came and said to the man, sacrifice, give us flesh to roast for the priest. He will not have it sodden flesh of thee, but he wants it raw. That is, they were preventing it from being offered to the Lord, and they were taking it for themselves. Uh, these men were wicked. They later died under judgment. Verse 12 says they were sons of Belial, which basically means sons of wickedness or sons of the devil. Verse 22 tells us they were sexually immoral. And their practice of taking meat before it was cooked and taking away from, from God what was being offered to him was certainly a violation of God's law for the sacrifices. Uh, it shouldn't have been taken raw. It should have been uh, cooked. It should have been fully cooked before the priest took it. Again, but this was more of a pagan practice. Uh, it was following heathen customs rather than God's law. Uh, the law of Moses made it clear that priests were to receive a portion of the sacrifices for their own personal food. Deuteronomy 18.3 says they get uh, certain parts, the breast that was waved before the Lord and a, and a thigh that was waved before the Lord. That was their portion. Uh, after it was sacrificed, after it was offered after it was cooked. But these sons of Belial weren't content with what God gave them. They wanted more, and they took more. And they did it the same way that heathen priests did uh, in false religion out there. And they were blending true religion with pagan practices, and it would dilute the pure worship of the Israelites. They made it look like those pagan rituals were just as good as God's ceremonies, and they weren't. It caused men to think it wasn't important to follow God's law precisely, that those precepts didn't have to be followed. It says in verse 17 of 1 Samuel 2, Therefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. What it's saying is that other people didn't think they had to do it the way God's law set it out in Leviticus and in the law of Moses. They began to abhor God's law because of the poor example of those two priests. We have to be careful that we properly represent the Lord to the world around us, too. We can't be poor examples. If we don't faithfully do what God asks, others will watch us, and they'll feel like it doesn't matter. If the ministry doesn't, if that person who claims to be a child of God doesn't do it that right, then why should I do it right? But the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 3.17, 
And again in 2 Thessalonians 3.9, that we need to be good examples to the flock. Examples that are worth following. And that's true for every disciple of Jesus Christ today. Go out and be a good example that points others to Jesus Christ. So this is all we have had time for tonight. Again, if you have questions for our next week's Bible study, please feel free to submit those in the coming days. But until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.